Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Linda Mayer. Some of you will know me, of course. I've got some of my wonderful staff here tonight as well. Uh, some personal friends, some wonderful crew from Green Cross that I know. Thanks for coming along. We've come together with the council. We've been passionate for a while about offering more to the community as dog owners. Um, I think there's a lot of education that people would benefit from if we could give it. And it's not about you know, necessarily having the most well-behaved dog or, de or a dog that competes in a show at the Cairns show, but it's about people understanding dogs a little bit and just having a bit of knowledge. So we thought probably one of the most, well, it is the most controversial topic, and I know from previously working in animal management, that barking is a huge issue, uh, not only for dog owners, but for other residents in the community that experience the barking of their neighbour's dogs or people's dogs down the street. So we thought let's initially start with a topic that we could probably all benefit from. So even if your dog's not known to be an excessive barker, you can certainly you know, take on board some of the tips that I'll give tonight. It's gonna to be a very brief overview as we know, because it's a, it's a topic that can expand into many different behavioural problems. So it's not just black and white sometimes. It's certainly not an easy fix. So I would say to anyone that, you know, even if you ring me privately to talk about this, it's not gonna be something that would be fixed in five minutes. And it does require commitment, but I think any part of dog ownership does do that. So I just wanted to introduce to my very special friend, Ellie, who's laying there having a sleep. She's my Australian Shepherd that comes along and does a lot of work with me. I have two other beautiful dogs, but she tends to be the one that enjoys coming to do some stuff like this. So I will touch on crating as part of um, some stuff we're going to talk about tonight and also the benefits just I like to people to see it in its physical sense because many people are concerned about doing things like this with dogs just as part of a training program and um, I think she's proof in the pudding that there's not too much stress going on there at the moment with that dog um, she's quite happy to be there so we're just going to as I said I've broken tonight down into just some very basic topics initially and we'll go through those each each one individually and then at the end, everyone's welcome to ask some questions. And if you have any questions and you can't get to it tonight, by all means, I've left my cards there as well. Just give me a call. I'm happy to talk to people as much as you'd like to talk to me about your dogs. If I can help in some way like that, even if you're not coming to my classes, you're very welcome. So why do dogs bark? Common causes, as we know. We've got boredom, lack of physical and mental stimulation, which is a big one. Territorial behaviour, separation anxiety, attention-seeking behaviour, fear, and during play, all right? So just going on to that first one, boredom. Many people ring me with these problems and I did laugh when we got those photos together because thankfully I've not come home to that just yet. <laughs> but I know people who have, okay? So remembering with destruction like that, it can also be a combination of behaviours that have caused that as well. But many dogs that are doing that sort of thing are also barking. So when I talk to people with my business and with my classes and the behaviour consults I do, we discuss a lot of things about what can we do to keep our dogs busy. So we all know that we can give them a bone and we can do things like that. We can give them a toy. I think what happens there is we commonly give them toys and bones all the time so the dog becomes used to the same thing every day. A bit like kids, they get bored with the same activities. So I would firstly recommend Varying things, not a bone every day too. A lot of dogs I see are too well fed, so bones actually aren't that interesting. They'd rather go and bury them in the garden and dig a big hole in your garden while they're doing it. Um, I would certainly recommend toys, but I would look at the sort of toys that you have. I've actually had people say their neighbours complain about the squeaky noise that the toy's making whilst the dog's playing with it. So you can have controversy even over a toy you might give your dog to keep them entertained. I like to do other little activities, which some of my staff do regularly now, and they tell me have great results with. Um, I like to scatter feed dogs. So that's a great way to keep them busy. That can literally mean just putting some dry food out just before you leave. Obviously, dog away from the situation first, plant a little bit, but I initially would say to anyone doing that, start it as a small process, fairly close to say the back, back of the veranda or somewhere close where the dog would initially find reward, and then over time extend the area that you plant it. So people have great success with that, for a start. Some more natural things I like to give dogs. Um, my dogs actually don't have many toys, to be honest. They're not interested in them, but they spend a lot of time chewing bits of wood that are laying around, bits and pieces like that that I'll get. Some of the crew find coconut husks are great. Again, medically, I always say to people to talk to your vet about that with some dogs who could actually ingest some of that and eat it, though. So I'm always very careful. A lot of dogs like to shred coconuts, but some dogs actually then like to eat some of that sort of stuff as well. So you'd be careful about that sort of thing. Um, just other activities around, some people can plant things here and there, not only food based, but reward and toy based behavioural things too. And most of the dogs that I deal with, which goes into a lot of other topics, are also under, under exercised 
physically and also mentally understimulated. So therefore, over time, they're not actually getting enough work for their brain or their body. And that can then progress into some of this destructive stuff. So even though you can provide a great amount of toys and bones for those sort of dogs, there's too much else going on as well. They're not even interested in some of that sort of stuff. All right, so that would be the first. There's many other little things. I always say to people, there's so much access to ideas literally online nowadays that people make up their own little activity things for dogs that I think are fantastic. I'm not saying don't go and buy things from pet shops and stuff, but have a look at, some, I always look at some of the texture. So this dog here loves wood, just sticks, not hard sticks. I'll often get soft sticks. Certain trees around are like that. Sometimes they'll pick up a little bit of driftwood from the beach even. Doesn't eat it, so I'm careful of that. She doesn't eat it, but she loves chewing them. And she's actually encouraged my little Shih Tzu Poodle to do the same thing. He carries them around as best he can. Um, and more so than, as I said, I've got a couple of rubber dog toys laying in the yard and those dogs probably pick them up once every six months, if that. And it would only be if I actually physically throw them. So a lot of those things I think are probably things that just sit in the yard and aren't even worth worrying about for the dog. Would certainly be encouraged to use it if you're playing with them. All right, so if we go on to why do dogs bark lack of stimulation? All right, so we've got some photos there today that I just wanted to, I suppose, explain a little bit to you as well. So there's a difference in taking a dog to a dog park and letting it run around like, like a mosh pit, as I say in my classes, which is what a lot of dog exercise areas are. So we're physically creating dogs that are canine athletes, but we're not doing anything with their brain. And over time, we're winding them up to be fitter and fitter. So if they were Kelpies on a sheep farm, that would be ideal. But when they're dogs that are required to sit in the backyard for quite a long time, I think that also is something people need to address. Because we concentrate a lot on throwing the ball or taking them to the beach and letting them run for three quarters of an hour down the beach, whilst they're usually harassing other people and other dogs as well. But we're not doing anything mentally to work the dog. So stimulation can come from walking, obviously, but I like to promote controlled walking, more so than dogs running around everywhere, sniffing the ground and dragging their owners up the street. And I also like to promote a lot of actual brain work, like you're seeing there. So people underestimate the value of those dogs laying in a line on a drop position there with the owners at front, they've given a stay command. As those dogs are laying there, those brains are working. All right, there's impulse control going on, there's all sorts of communication between the dogs there. And many people underestimate that, I think we all concentrate on the physical side of things. So I would certainly recommend to anyone, not necessarily that you have to do formal obedience classes by any means, but look at some ways to actually train your dog to use its brain a bit through some obedience command work, okay? And certainly controlled walking is, is a big thing. So again, if the dog's out on the street pulling you up the street on the end of a lead, then it's generally, undoubtedly probably got other behavioural um, problems at any point that are compounding with that as well, which can then lead to barking. Remember, overexcited, overstimulated dogs walking on leads, either out in the middle of the street or up the footpath along other people's fence lines are creating barking problems as well. All right, so I know no one here probably does fall in that category, but when you're allowing your dog to walk up the fence line of someone else's dog on a fence on the opposite side, you are creating a problem for your own dog, plus that dog inside the fence. So I know with proof with my own that when new dogs move into my street, if my dogs walk calmly up the street for a week or so, those new dogs don't bark at my dogs. Yet you will see them regularly barking at other dogs that are out of control. So I think that's a relevant issue. If we all addressed how our dogs walk, and how we walk them up the street, would we then create a calmer neighbourhood anyway? Okay, obviously a bit nicer to walk your dog when it's walking nicely like that as well, which is doable for anybody. Okay, I never say to anyone it's not possible to achieve that, but it takes work. So I, I used to be someone that said, look, it's just a little walk every day and that, but what I know is it's commitment. It's a daily commitment. It's not a lifestyle of eight hours a day, but it's commitment every day to achieve that with your dog. And the work you put in, will be seen on the end of the lead as time goes on and certainly in the behaviour of the animal as well. All right, so again, we'll, we'll touch on a lot of these when you ask me questions too, but it's nice for you to see um, different concepts of what I think training's about and where's training's going since 25 years ago when I started all of this stuff. So if my little, yeah, there we go, territorial barking. This is probably one of the most common barking related issues, I would reckon, if we were to, it's hard to know because you can't always get, you know, a lot of times when complaints come in, it's just necessarily that the dog's barking. But I know from my own personal involvement with dogs over the years, you would have the instance of the dog on the left just barking probably at, at traffic moving past 
and that can obviously, our most common issue that we see with that would be the postman. Everyone sees the dog or hears the dogs that are getting wound up as the postman's coming up the street. But then your territory barking where you've got dogs neighbouring each other on properties, barking through fence lines. And even when it's not a visible situation like that, we're getting a lot of territory barking, even if they can't see each other. Okay? As I said, dogs barking on fence lines. So I'm a huge believer in you need to look at your own environment in the yard. For me, we recently changed the dynamics of our property um, through choice because we replaced our front fence. We put our dogs to the back and we're in a close, so it's very quiet there really. And after three months of doing that and having them temporarily fenced to the back, me and my husband looked at each other and said, we're actually going to remain, it's going to stay like this. Even though we had a small amount of traffic, as we say, walking, riding bikes, walking dogs past, we had virtually zero barking compared to the occasional barking that we had when people were moving past. So even me, to be home, to, I can't be home 24-7 to control that, and that's the biggest issue too. You can do all the training in the world, but then at the end of the day, while well, you've done three hours of training every day for a week and then you're away for a, a, an eight-hour shift at work, your dog could likely be running up and down the fence barking again. So for my dogs, it's a better, it's a better option. They're calm. They're a lot quieter. They're less stressed because they don't feel the need to be barking up and down territorially to do that sort of thing. Remember, dogs going up and, down, up and down fence lines will literally be achieving something in their own mind. So it's a chase type behaviour and if you have a working breed that escalates as we know and actually then starts to bring out genetic behaviour in them as well. So I would say as hard as that can be for some people, I understand the logistics of that. If you have the option to fence your dog away from a main traffic area, same as I get a lot of people asking me about laneways up the side of properties. All right, that's a big one territory of other dogs around you so no you can't fence your dog completely into a small box in the middle of the yard so it doesn't access all the fences but again there's certain times most of you would notice that dogs are active to do a lot of that behavior I see my own we have with neighbors out the back in a pool they'll actually go down barking often at the kids playing in the pool which doesn't happen every day but it's generally a weekend activity that the family does there which is fine because that's their property so I'm respectful of that this brings into play where I use things like this so if they're having their Saturday afternoon barbecue with their family, my dogs run down to bark and they have dogs at the back too and they never bother each other any other time. Then I, as the responsible neighbour, will say to my dogs, you need to come up and sit in your crates for a while now, basically. Those people have a right to be in their backyard doing what they're doing. And I'm not stepping out the door every five minutes to yell out at you to come back here. So although I could correct that when I'm home, again, there's times where I can't. So if I can modify that, and I know generally it's not happening through the day. Little things like that, I think we as owners as well need to be a little bit considerate of other people. So a lot of people would say, look, my dog's just in the yard and it's just barking. But is that also showing respect to other people who perhaps don't have a dog or who have a dog that doesn't bark a lot in general if we all work together? I think that's a huge thing to think about. Um, if you have issues with two dogs fighting through a fence line, then there's a lot of behavioural stuff that needs to be done. The hard part about that is that sometimes the people who own the other dog may not be as receptive to help out with that stuff. So it's a, it's a very technical issue that I'll often go through with people, but it's not a five minute fix for that either. So again, we would address many reasons as to why that's happening. Again, what I do know is a mentally and physically tired dog is less likely to behave with a lot of these issues, okay? If you get along with your neighbours as well, and, and we hope that everyone does, then I would also suggest talking to them a little bit, you know, and we can, we can go through that a little bit more too um, as we get further through the slides. Just talking to people about how they go about interacting with your dog. A lot of people think they're doing the right thing often. I've even had people say their neighbours throw food over the fence to the dog and stuff. Often that's actually encouraging the behaviour. So if we're walking, we know keep the dog away from fence lines. Don't let your dog go up and down people's nature strip using that as a toilet. That's aggravating the dogs inside as well, which is a common problem why dogs get very ag agitated at that. You know, early hours of the morning, as we know, and late evening is a high traffic time. So if I lived on a busy area and I knew that I had people going past, if I couldn't fence my dogs to the back, I'd be looking at options like this as to how I could actually contain my animals in that high traffic time. So I'm not just not going to allow that behaviour to even happen. Therefore, I don't have to correct anything. Over time, I can remove the interest in a lot of dogs by doing that. All right, and I have done it with dogs, with clients. We can't stop a, bug, a dog barking completely. That's a, a, a crucial thing that we all need to understand. You can't completely stop them barking, but you can certainly help them cope with situations. The longer the behavior goes on, the harder it is to fix. So if we wait till we've had a complaint or we get notes from neighbors, or we have a dog that's extremely agitated and stressed and starts doing things you know, that could hurt itself or anyone else or even it's another dog that's on the property. So we see instances where dogs are running fence lines where they'll redirect to each other if there's one, more than one dog. 
and often owners would go to correct and they'll redirect that, that frustration and anxiety and aggression onto their owner, that's when we know we've probably let it go a long way past where it should have gone and we really need to start to address it quite seriously. Some of you may have seen that where you're walking, you'll see two dogs on a fence line barking flat out at someone walking past, then they'll all of a sudden turn in that anxious moment and actually redirect it often towards each other. And that can escalate to a major problem. So little things like that we're aware of as well. Um, our next little slide of, so separation anxiety, probably one of the biggest problems that dog owners face today. Even if their dog's not barking, I see more anxious dogs now than I've ever seen in my life doing this, and I have, haven't really been doing it that long. And why do I think that's happened? I think the dynamics, as I say, of dog ownership has changed immensely. So I think we, more than any other time in our lives, all of us are, are actually humanising them. We are thinking human when we're interacting with them. We are treating them like human babies, some of us. And we are forgetting that at the end of the day, every dog, no matter what shape or size, has a canine brain. And they don't think like us. And they don't speak our language, because as I said, they could actually all be sitting in the chair right now having a listen to me if they did. And we could explain to them, could you please stop doing this because this is causing problems? Or why are you feeling anxious? Is it something we're doing wrong? But dogs don't understand any of that. What we've done is changed how we live with them. So for me, as a, with a rural background, I just look at, for a start, the amount of dogs that are inside homes now, that are living in homes as if the home belongs to them, as if it's their castle, as I say, where it's actually ours. So I would certainly address that as part of separation anxiety, for a start. So a dog that is constantly with its owner, even if you work eight hours and then you come home and you have the dog constantly with you then, without moments of separation and boundary and a little bit of training where you could say to the dog, I'm, I'm sitting over here and you can sit over here, you are slowly over time building up anxiety. Okay, we all try to substitute, or we've been away for eight hours, we need to give them as much as we can while we're home. That's actually often the wrong way to go about it. It's a great thing, I think you can have dogs inside, but if you set those boundaries, I think they're better for it. I think they're better inside, outside, if you're gonna go that way, not totally inside. My dogs live totally outside, that's just my personal choice. I don't have issues with separation anxiety, but I do use many things like these training tools, as I say, to help. So for many owners, again, with separation, we look at what do we do before we go? There's a common rule out there, and most people would be aware of it now. You should ignore your dog before you leave. Most of us build up anxiety. We're even thinking about how we're feeling. It starts to portray all these emotions to the dog. Remember, dogs can literally smell our emotions. So we know they smell things from us because we see them in assistance roles, we see them doing things that are beyond our comprehension as humans, as I say. There's many things about them that are way beyond how intelligent we really think we are. But people actually go down the wrong road, so they, they portray anxiety. The more they see anxiety in their dog, they try to soothe it out of the dog. They try to treat the dog like a child and they talk to it and try to explain to it that you need to calm down, I'm going to work for eight hours, darling, I'll be home. I'll leave the radio on, love, and a few little things for you to do. And I hear people talk to dogs like that, and it's okay, but the dog's got no idea what you're talking about. Okay, all it knows is for some reason your body's starting to emit all these pheromones that is full of anxiety, you're sounding anxious in the way you're speaking, and now you're gonna turn around and walk out the door and leave me here. So if we built up confidence in that behavior for a while, and we worked on ignoring the dog, I always say 10 minutes, but for me it wouldn't even be a, a time frame. If I'm going to work in the morning, I might walk my dogs like I do, out in the yard, see you later. I'll see you when I get back. There's no goodbyes, there's no looking at them even when we leave, everyone in the car, off we go. Same when we come home. People build all that anxiety up, they arrive home, dogs jumping all over them. They've got a dog yelping and barking and doing so, and then we're going back to barking because it's barking when you're arriving and it's jumping all over you and it's annoying the neighbours while it's doing it. And then we're trying to correct barking and all the other behaviour and jumping and the things that we don't want, but we need to look at that anxiety thing as well and say, look, if we just set a pattern of letting the dog settle each time we come home, over time we would start to see a decrease in that dependency as well. All right? So they're big things that I work on. I, as I say, think anxiety is one of the biggest behavioural problems that I see now. And when people feel unsure about changing the lifestyle with their dog, <coughs> I would constantly use my own dogs, my staff's dogs, as examples to say there is no anxiety or stress at this point in that animal. Okay, We could look at that and say she's in a cage, but 
the behaviour of that dog does not display any issue at all with that. Now I use these as a kennel on my veranda. My dogs don't live in cages or crates as we call them. But I use them as a training tool. This dog's never been here. All she knows is when this crate's just relax and be calm. Nothing to worry about. Won't matter what's going on around you. So lots of stuff I can guide through people through with that. Um, and sometimes in the most severe cases, we would need to contain dogs. Separation anxiety, I've seen dogs leaping over fences you wouldn't even think possible for them to get out. And then again, we have a lot of barking and separation. I hear it actually a little bit in my neighbourhood with a couple of dogs, so I hear them howling every time the owners leave. What I do know, and that's not, you know, is that those dogs never get walked. I've lived there for eight years and I've never seen those dogs out of the yard. Okay, so we wonder, you know, is the dog happy? I can't really say that because no dog's ever been able to tell me that. But what I do know is when it's anxious, it's not happy because when I'm anxious, I'm not happy. If I've got stress, okay, I'm not feeling great. But remembering a little bit of stress to push through to a good result at the end is okay. And that's where I know a lot of people feel uncertain about behavioural changes or interactive changes with their dog because they feel the dog's going to be stressed so I need to stop. But we all know if we just pushed a little bit further through that, we would get a great result at the other end and the animal would be better for it. So I like to, as much as I can, help people get through that stuff because it's the human that needs the help often as we know. The dog would be fine as long as we can help the people to get you know, to the other side of it. And hopefully you don't come home to that um, at any point. So we can only imagine the stress some of those dogs have gone through. I know some of those photos are set up, but to, to, to get to that point. Can you imagine the stress that animal's going through to get to that point? Yet if we could implement some things into our lifestyle that would remove the anxiety like that to do things like that, then that would be a great result. It's not going to be a total fix. I do, I have owned dogs over the years that still chew things occasionally. Mine are not perfect. My old border collie's not here, but she's the one that if she could speak for herself would say, but she still digs holes occasionally. So, you know, they're not, they're an animal. We can't make them a robot. They like to have a bit of fun doing natural things. So what else have we got that makes dogs bark? So attention seeking. All right, when I go and do behaviour consults, that, in, that middle picture actually makes me smile because they're things I look at when I walk into people's houses. Is there big slobber marks up the back door? All right, or screens half hanging off, which is common. Or people have already told me they've replaced the door 25 times before I came and, and things like that. So that can be attention seeking barking, which generally, as we know, would often happen when you're home. But again, it's an annoying bark to the people next door. And it's a dog that's not only anxious, but it's also started to realise many times after doing it repeatedly that I'll probably get what I want if I keep up with this stuff. So how do we work through that? And then the other picture I thought was just relevant because a lot of people not thinking can be in the backyard with a dog that's attention seeking with a ball throwing activity, for example, and it's barking its head off. Okay, or it's a dog that every time you walk out, it grabs a ball and races to you and drops it at your feet. All right. Now remember that dog over time is building up a certain amount of anxiety and anticipation over the object. So there's a stress issue related there and an anxiety based behaviour. And then we have the dogs of course that are attention seeking, so they have an anxiety based behaviour which probably would extend into separation anxiety I would imagine for most of them when the owners are not there. Many different types of behaviour that we can work on um, I'm a believer if your dog loves to chase a ball, that's great, but the ball should be put away and bought out when you decide, not the dog. So I like to use that also as a great way to reward. So we can use a dog that's motivated by those sorts of activities in training as well to say, look, this is something that's gold for you. So let's do some really good stuff together. And then that's your reward at the end. And as we know in working dogs and in service dogs, that's generally the, it's really the base of what they do in the training. So any of our police dogs, any of those dogs that do those amazing jobs that we see, there's always a tug reward at the end of, of an activity like that or some sort of activity that, that really promotes the dog's behaviour to keep doing those activities for them. They generally use very little food-based training in those sorts of things, as we know, but they, they genetically will, will choose dogs that have a high drive to chase things and get a reward that way. So that is certainly something, but I mean, for myself at home, on a personal level, if we throw the ball in the backyard, um, this one loves to chase the ball with the kids and the other little dog do loves to as well but the border collie just would be happy to run around both of them barking madly so it annoys me let alone my neighbours so what do I do I crate the older border collie in her crate and the kids can play with the other two for a while she's calm and quiet in the crate because she knows that routine and then from there she can come out later and that's really the only time you hear her bark in actual fact is in chase behaviour she's not interested in the ball she's trying to work the dogs as nature would have said to her many years ago when she was a pup. Something in my brain says, when they run, I need to chase them and bark. 
So I can utilise training equipment in my home to make sure that I keep everything as calm for myself and also my dogs and, you know, be compliant for my neighbours. So attention-seeking behaviour, that's, that's actually something that we need to address though. So dogs at the back door and things like that, it's not about bursting the back door open and bellowing at your dogs and then you have your neighbours thinking, well, I'm not sure whether the barking dog's worse or the neighbour screaming every five minutes out the back door at the dog. But there's ways we work on behavioural things like that. As I said, there's, there's a, a myriad of things I would go through with people to fix that stuff. And again, not just a quick five minute step out the back door, because most of us will go through this scenario, open the back door. Now sit down, darling, please stop doing that. Sit down. Okay, you're scratching all the back of my door. Now stop doing that. Close the door, sit down, or even look at the dog again, up to where we started from. So at that point, we should all be realising, obviously the dog has no idea what I'm talking about. Okay? And that's the thing. We can go through a whole paragraph of behavioural explanation as to why we would rather they don't do that, but if they understood that, they would never keep repeating it. I've seen dogs go for years and be told the same thing and they still perform the same behaviour. So they obviously are not wanting to be compliant or more importantly, they have no idea what we're talking about. All right, again, Ellie's not absorbing one single thing that I'm saying at the moment, I don't think. <laughs> she's probably thought, she's not saying I've heard it all before. So little things like that to address, and me personally, I address it regularly because it is an issue and I, the dog annoys me barking when we're playing, so I just control it, easy. It doesn't happen any other time for that particular dog, so I can easily make my neighbourhood comfortable that way and keep everything quiet um, where I need to. So our other little things that we have up here, little technological, there we go, fear. All right, so fear-based behaviour, and the dog on the left is obviously looking fairly uncertain about something going on, and the other one, of course, is going to probably be thinking about barking reflective to many things that we experience up here. We did also obviously bring into this category fireworks as well, which is huge. This dog is frightened of fireworks, which I've discovered recently. So fear-based barking, remember, can be not only thunder, fireworks, anything relevant to storm or, or things like that, but even different noises in your environment and your neighbourhood, things that sound similar to a noise that's an issue. So for this dog frightened of fireworks, I could say to you that if I walked through a job site and the boys were firing nail guns, I would nearly guarantee you that that dog would have an issue with that noise as well, a very similar type of noise. Yet other things you can do around this dog and it does not blink an eye. Yet I see my other dogs respond to certain things. So for myself, again, containment under moments of stress where I know there's fireworks around, obviously close to where I live, but also obviously at times when we know there's going to be a lot. Storms is not an issue. Storms are a hard one because as we know, you can go to work and it's sunny and then while you're at work at four o'clock in the afternoon, the clouds roll in and you have a big storm. I would say to anyone, if, you, if you're worried about your dog, you need to think of safe con containment of some sort. Does it have to be a crate? Not, not at all. Some people I know will safely contain their dog in a cooler room of the house, things like that. Obviously, I wouldn't put it in places where there could be hundreds of items of furniture that might get chewed under stress. But it, we remember with these things, it's not about, oh, I have a frightened dog, so I immediately need to put it in a crate. This is a process that starts over time. So if it was going to be a room in your house, you would slowly get the dog used to that over time. You wouldn't just wait till the storm season and think, right, well, we've designated that the bathroom where it's nice and cool is where that dog will go in the storm season and we'll just throw it in there now and off we go. These things need to be done over a period of time, which doesn't take a lot of time once you get the animal comfortable. So at any point, at some stage, I'll bring Ellie out and show you, as soon as I walk that dog to the crate, that's what she knows, it's calm and quiet to go there. So in any place in a house, you could, you could have the same scenario. Um, I have many people with high set Queenslanders that build some great little smaller safe enclosures under their homes, even things like that. The main thing is, as we know, that the dog needs to be cool, shaded, have access to water, and that the fencing and the area that you provide is safe. So don't underestimate what an animal will do under fear. Um, I have seen what she has done and pushed through a fence I wouldn't even think her head would foot fit through, let alone her body and she has done it. So we need to be aware of that always. When I'm saying to people contain an animal, be, be very, very careful about what you're doing. Perhaps test it a few times when you're around close to sea. You can buy products that desensitise them to certain noises. I think what I find maybe sometimes a problem there is you can have the tape of thunder and do all the training and 
but then you might out of the blue have a thunderstorm that comes through at night that rocks the roof on our house like some of them do and it could set the dog straight back. So I would always be work, you know, working towards, for me, for her, anything that I think could be anywhere near fireworks, even if it's 300 kilometres away, but putting her in a crate safe. And she, because she's, such, she's conditioned to that behaviour there, she stays safely, she never tries to break out. Now I see severe anxiety in some dogs with that. I also then recommend them often to see people medically at the veterinary practices because some dogs actually probably need some help to get over some anxieties like that if they're really seriously bothered um, and certainly will escape. But be aware of fear. So what I do say about fear though in the neighbourhood. So some dogs are, uns there's certain noises that our dogs hear every day that we don't even hear sometimes, but that, they, that affect them. Whether it's a positive or a negative, they're actually hearing things that we don't even think about. So it goes back to some of that stuff I say to people too. If you walk your dog regularly, so I believe you should walk the same, literally the same route every day around your neighbourhood, which we do. We throw in an odd different activity here and there, and obviously they do a lot of training with us, our dogs, and all my staff do the same thing. So the dog gets used to that same environment. So those noises that we don't hear and we don't even think about, they hear regularly if they're walking every day. They perhaps see the dog that they hear three houses down that's barking. They hear that car that leaves at 6.30 every morning and then they see where it is and they slowly over time get conditioned that that's just around the corner and they don't think like that, but it's a territory type thing that they're covering every day. Then over time, a lot of the dogs don't bark at some of those things. As I said, the dog around the street from us moved in doesn't even bark at my dogs now and my dogs aren't bothered by it. Initially they were when it moved in because it had never been there before. Now we walk quietly past, it looks up and literally puts its head back down and goes to sleep. So that dog stopped barking its front yard and my dogs are not at all worried about that dog either now as they walk past. So if we expose them to the same thing, over time noises would be less of an issue for a lot of dogs. We will get new things move into the neighbourhood, which of course would reignite a lot of barking for some of them. But it's not, I'm a great believer in that routine and consistency because in a natural state, that's what they would do. They don't, as I say, get together every Sunday at a dog park in, nature, in the wild and have a barbecue and have a chat about the week they've had together. They uh, would initially cover their same territory, be calm and relaxed in doing that. Everyone has a run when we've got to hunt meat and apart from that, there's not much else going on. So although domestic dogs are very far removed from wild dogs now, there's still a lot of their behaviour that's very similar. And I know if we keep that routine, they're much better off for it. So it's interesting to think with dogs that are often fearful in their yards, Perhaps if people got them out more so that they could actually see what's behind those fences and everything and experience it, would be better. And then the other big mistake we make is people start consoling them when they see them like that. They try to soothe behaviour out of dogs. We try to kiss and cuddle them and tell them it's okay. We can help you through this. It's just a nasty thunderstorm. Please sit down. They start patting them. Again, you're just reinforcing the behaviour. You're portraying your anxiety. You're praising the dog for the behaviour it's displaying. And over time, you're just layering that behaviour. So it's a big thing why, again, if we can start to calmly teach them places, I'm not even, if people say to me their dog goes under the bed in a thunderstorm, I think that's okay as long as the dog's happy under there, leave it there. Don't try and drag it out and ask it to sit beside you on the couch and you can talk to it about the storm that's happening overhead. If it's safe under there and it's not hurting itself or anything else, I've seen dogs over the years that have been fine to do that. But make sure that you're not actually, as I say, trying to actually console behaviour. And that would be any fear-based behaviour. When everyone sees a dog like that, we all go to water and we immediately want to put our arms around it and tell it it's okay. But really that's one of the biggest mistakes we would make in a fear, fear related behaviour. So what else have we got there, Michelle, during play? So why I actually wanted to put this one up just as a little bit separate one is because I know, because I've taken a lot of notice that when I'm driving around, at some of the exercise areas, for example, not only in our backyard, people get down to our dog exercise areas letting dogs run mad barking, which could not at all be nice for the people that reside around those exercise areas who've been approved or have obviously, you know, been happy to have that go in or, or certainly been a little bit understanding of the fact that we need to have areas, I suppose, where dogs can run. But I do know that I've seen it regularly. People have dogs running everywhere going mad. So I thought it was appropriate to just put that up to, for people to think about that. If you're going somewhere with your dog to exercise them I in a designated dog exercise area, not just randomly running wild in parks everywhere and places where they shouldn't be off a lead, then we should be addressing that as well as responsible owners. So if you've got a dog that you throw the ball for, you know, for in those places and it's barking excessively, then I would recommend that you do it somewhere else. Because could you only imagine what it must be like to live somewhere near, like, near that and have that same repetition of that thing every afternoon for some people? You know, I think most of those people in those areas must be very understanding of, of what they experience as dog owners. 
So I, I personally, as I say, don't mind dog exercise areas, but I'm, I'm one that's very vigilant with my clients about what I think you should be doing as far as exercising where you should take them. So I think they should be areas that are used sensibly, but not an excuse Instead of taking the dog for a walk and doing some proper work and training with it, I'll just take it down to the park or the beach and let it run wild everywhere and then I can sit under the shade of the tree and do nothing and eventually the dog will wear itself out. But eventually the dog gets fitter and fitter, as I say, and it's not doing anything else. And then we have obedience problems relevant, or, you know, compliance of commands or the simple thing, can't call the dog as it runs towards someone else's dog. So just something to be aware of. As I said, if it's in the backyard or it's anywhere else, but just be receptive of people around you that might, you know, be living in houses close to those areas and having to listen to the barking and dogs running madly every day. Um, I can't remember what else we... What else? So, yeah. It's a brief overview, because I could go on for a long, long time about behaviour. Behaviour is my passion, because dog training is easy. Anyone can teach a dog to do a few basic commands. Teaching a dog how to live happily in the mad world that we live in now, I think, is a whole different kettle of fish. I think they live, they're expected to live a lot differently to when I even grew up as a child. And I think that's part of also why we're seeing so many issues. Is it because they're in smaller yards and everything? I don't think that's relevant. So when people say to me they've got three acres, they don't need to walk the dog. I don't think that's relevant unless you have a working dog that's chasing sheep for 10 hours a day. Okay, what I do know is having worked in a field in a rural community, when we had working dogs on the farm, they were tied up and they'd run 100 k's a day, some of them probably or more. But if I'd taken those dogs off that chain and put them in my backyard, would they have settled immediately into that environment? No way. So it's not about the distance they cover, it's the mental state of the animal as well while it's expected to live. Do dogs need company? I think they benefit from company of their own kind. I see some dogs that pair up with cats as an example. So I think they appreciate the company of something. But I think dogs can also be slowly, you know, you can condition an animal to be comfortable on its own if you, if you provide enough for it in its life, but it doesn't mean you have to be there 10 or 12 hours a day to, to do that. I've done it myself. I think they benefit from company, as I say, but I don't think it's a total necessity. And if you've got a barking dog, the first thing you don't do is go out and get another dog to stop the barking, because you're probably going to end up with two dogs barking. All right, and many dogs, as we know, with anxiety, actually aren't even interested in the other dog people have bought. They've still got the issue relevant to the owner. So some big things like that I would say to people, 